coming. Um, it's been a real good series, and the, the last semester was really good, and this part is, is starting out in a fantastic way, and it's going to be just as good or better all the way through as last semester was. Um, so thanks for coming. Um, I think that's all I have to say. Um, there's a sheet going around. There's a sheet going around, and so be sure to put your um, email address on it so that we can contact you. Uh, we can send you mail directly so that you'll know uh, when it is. And also, if you happen to get the, the direct mail that comes from John, and you get one that comes from me, believe John's. <laughs> because today, I sent, I, yesterday I sent three emails that had, well, I sent two emails that had three incorrect times on them. So, believe his, but you'll get it. We're all here, we're all here, it's all good. <laughs> anyway, thanks again for coming, and um, now we'll meet our guest. Thank you, gentlemen. Um, thank you again, everyone, for coming, and good afternoon. Uh, welcome to another event of the 1619 and Beyond series, Explorations in Atlanta Slavery and Its American Legacy. Uh, the program is sponsored by the Department of History, the Department of African and African American Studies, the Center for Historical Research, the Office of Diversity and Inclusion, and the Ohio Early American Seminar. And thank you to Stephanie, to John, to Simone, um, and to Laura and to Rhonda for logistical work that went uh, into putting this together. So today I have the honor to introduce our esteemed guest, Dr. Jennifer Morgan. She's a professor of history and chair of social and cultural analysis at New York University and the author of the groundbreaking book, Laboring Women, Gender and Reproduction in the Making of New World Slavery, published in 2004, which if you've taken any classes in the field, you have definitely read. Uh, and the co-editor of Connections, Histories of Race and Sex in America, published in 2016. Her research examines the intersections of gender and race in the Black Atlantic. She has also published a range of essays on race, gender, and the process of doing history, and is currently at work on a project that considers colonial numeracy, racism, and the rise of the transatlantic slave trade in the 17th century English Atlantic, tentatively titled Accounting for the Women in Slavery. Her talk today is titled Mad Women on the Slave Ship, Reproducing Racial Capitalism in the Early Black Atlantic. Uh, please join me in welcoming Bob Um, uh, I wanted to really thank everyone for um, inviting me to be in this series, particularly because I, I know that they're, I mean, I feel very honored in the, the company that I'm in, um, the speakers who you've had and who are coming this, uh, this uh, semester, so I appreciate that, I'm really honored. Um, so the talk that I'm giving today is my effort to kind of pull back a little bit from the book manuscript that I actually have just finished, Whoa. yay, <laughs> um, which is now, because Caitlin Rosenthal published a book called Accounting for Slavery, is now called Reckoning with Slavery, Gender, Kinship, and Capitalism in the Black Atlantic. It's coming out at Duke University Press, you know, sometime soon. Um, so that is what I'm doing now, is to kind of talk you through some of the ideas that I'm exploring there. Um, so, let me start with a story of madness. In 1675, uh, in 1675, on the ship James, death began to seize the ship even before it pulled away from the Gold Coast. One woman who died before the ship set off to the West Indies demanded my attention. Her misery must have been excruciating, as she, quote, miscarried, and the child dead within her and rotten, she died two days after delivery. The agony of that experience shimmers through the columns of the ship captain's account of the mortality aboard the James. The link between her and another woman lost during the passage may not have been obvious to the crew, but they seem to me to be intimately connected. Little more than two months later, in the middle of the ocean, another mother on the ship succumbed after what the captain saw as maternal madness. Quote, being very fond of her child, carrying her up and down, wore her to nothing, by which means she fell into a fever and died." Close quote. The register of grief is erased from the captain's accounting, even, as, as, even if its traces can still be seen by us. 
But as the theorist Judith Butler has argued, without grievability, there is no life, or rather, there is something living that is other than life. Here, there is an account. Here, maternity and madness overlap, and the role of the captain as a distant observer leaves a trace on the history of the slave trade that evokes both the presence of pregnant women on ships and the perversion of what a pregnancy could bring. At the heart of Atlantic slavery, there's an unnervingly simple proposition that women and men purchased in African and American markets were a predictable investment. Even in a landscape of precarity, one that could reap returns both during and after the life of the enslaved worker, especially should that worker give birth to children. A buyer of human property marked by their capacity to convey their status as enslavable to the children or to their, their progeny could rest easy that such an investment would return profits and could be passed down to progeny of their own, a hope no less salient in the fact of the reality that that hope was undone often by premature death. In this way, slave ownership and the heritability of enslavement produce speculative possibility, boundless estates, and the idea of expanded wealth for generations, an economically rational proposition. But in Michelle Murphy's words, the economic rationality that attached to slave-based economic projections might be usefully considered a phantasmogram. Quote, a quantitative practice that is enriched with affect, that propagates imaginaries, that lures feeling, and hence that has supernatural effects in surplus, excuse me, in surplus of its rational precepts. The economy of transatlantic slavery was embedded in a rational phantasmogram upon which all manner of things could be built both real and imaginary, both tangible and amorphous. The wealth was real, as were the financial risks. The phantasms were the idea of slave, slave ownership without entanglement or culpability, the notion of the happy slave, the stupid slave, the loyal slave, the endless return on investments, the gentle and Christian slave owner. The reproductive capacity of enslaved women is at the heart of this fantasy. The appropriation of black futures through the transformation of enslaved women into generative forms of capital was the ideological foundation of hereditary racial slavery. Futurity was gendered. As slave regimes developed, they did so by legally distinguishing childbearing from kinship. They structured women's bodies at the center of a bare genealogy in which, as the literary scholar Nancy Bentley has argued, quote, kinlessness operates to make the facts of the body serve the socio-political order of New World slave societies. By providing a context through which the economization of the enslaved made moral and economic sense, kinlessness rendered hereditary enslavement legible to both slave owners and to the enslaved. Slavery is built on kinship and kinlessness. It destroys, exploits, and remade kinship among the enslaved through the contradictory claims made on African women that they birthed excuse me, that they birthed strangers or property rather than kin. So Durkheim said of kinship that it is a social tie or it is nothing. Kinship may reference procreation, but of course it's embedded in, um, in social life. It is the process by which people create interdependence. Marshall Solins concluded rather poetically that kinship is a mutuality of being and that kinfolk are people who belong to one another, who are members of one another. The language of race, of course, draws certainly on notions of kin and maps the deployment of kinship into larger structures of society and governance. It, it helps us to understand who could or could not be considered related in blood, in bond, in diplomacy, in law, fiction, religion, empire, and in the construction of the self. Kinship would, of course, come to be mobilized as a tool also of social control under slavery with slave owners using threats of family destruction as a means to wield power over the enslaved. This is a later development, the one that complements the claims that I'm exploring here for the early modern period, for this early modern consolidation of hereditary racial slavery. Kinship and kinlessness yield definitions and strategies for government, for settlement, for colonization, for domination and regulation, all of which are embedded in notions of race and racial hierarchy. So a nod to Durkheim's nothing, that kinship is, it can be, is, is nothing um, without the social forms, with the word kinlessness. 
meant to indicate not an ontological state, not a reality, but rather an accusation, a castigation, a charge from European travelers, slave traders, and slave owners that Africans produced only procreative ties, that they had no capacity to belong to one another. In the face of such attempts at erasure, kinship becomes key to enslaved persons' efforts to endure enslavement and to identify slavery's core violations. The novelist Nathaniel McKay says that the relationship between Africa and America is defined by the ruptures of maternal, est est maternal estrangement, what he calls wounded kinship. And indeed, in the pens of the formerly enslaved, kinship became a crucial space from which to launch a relentless critique of racial slavery. Whether it was in Harriet Jacobs' seven-year-long domestic exile to a three-foot-tall crawl space in her grandmother's attic, um, where she secretly watched over her children, or in Frederick Douglass's lament that his mother had many children, but that he had no family. Um, formerly enslaved people very clearly unpack the meaning of wounded kinship, the discovery that your family ties were illusory, and the assertion that they were not. But what of those ensnared in the hold of hereditary racial slavery at its beginning? Um, although, I must ask, can we really speak of beginnings? I'm not sure that we should, but bear with me, because that's what I'm about to do. <laughs> um, the evocation of kinship by 19th century abolitionists like Douglas and Harry Jacobs cements family as a key index of the immoral horrors of slavery, both for what slavery did for, to black families and for what it did to whites. But the problem of kinship in regard to the business of slavery enters the record much earlier. And it is in relationship to the business of slavery that kinlessness acquires, I believe, its most pointed analytic potential. In the hands of early European slave traders and, I'm sorry, in the hands of your early European <coughs> travelers and slave traders, kinship and its alleged absence emerged early as they constructed stories of rulers with massive harems, of women who abandoned children rather than impede their tribal wars, of childbirth as neither private nor painful, of incest and the free giving of wives and daughters as tokens of friendship to European adventurers. Their stories were of sexual depravity and bodily strangeness that testified to the absence of legible forms of family. Kinship was weaponized to define Africans as debased and to rationalize that debasement through the language of absent structures of family feeling. And that I'm drawing on um, Hortense Spiller's Mama's Baby, Papa's Maybe, in that formulation. So, slave traders and slave owners across the Atlantic world um, erected ideological scaffolds upon which they could legitimately consign African women and men to the living death of enslavement. In regards to the way they discussed and depicted women, that, that scaffold took the form of disavowal, claims that they were without pain, without purity without sensation, without kin, that they bred children like livestock in the West, in, on the West African coast and relinquished them with disinterest in the Americas. Of course, such blatant evidence of early modern prejudice has not gone unnoticed by scholars, but rather, including myself, um, but rather than clustering such um, descriptions <coughs> primarily on the balance sheet of prejudice, I want to situate those damning proclamations in the rationalizing account books of capitalism. The acts of instantiating kinlessness onto Africans and their descendants were embedded in the turn to the modern, in the turn to capitalism, and in the, in the liberal individuation of the universal subject. A subject, a universal in quotes, a subject whose familial location was framed by those who allegedly had no capacity to make family. Africans were situated then in, in zones of unbeing that marked out the presence of, um, of um, what Elizabeth Dillon calls genealogically reproductive enlightenment man. In other words, those people who can produce genealogy are made legible to us by those who cannot. Mm -hmm. Such phenomenon of knowledge production cast long shadows over our archives archives that routinely segregate family and culture from business and economy. So, this is the archive problem in which I am entangled. An effort to exhume the women who comprised upwards of 40% of those transported in the first 200 years of the Atlantic slave trade. 
and to extra extricate them from the ideological morass that threatens their enduring obscurity. European slavers and buyers were nonplussed when, with faith, excuse me, were non, there's some words that you write down and then they're very hard to say out <laughs> They were nonplussed when faced with the prospect of extracting hard labor from these women, and yet the archival traces of those women's existence are spotty and paltry. So the Slave Voyages database um, documents 4,355 slave trading voyages out of a total of about 35,000 from Africa in the first period of the slave trade, which I would say, which I'm counting as from 1514 to 1700. Um, fewer than 10% of those records contain information about the percentage of men and women on board those ships. The absence of crucial information is notable, and I can talk a little bit more about that. And of course, there are other ways that we know what the sex ratios were, but the ship captains don't provide that detail for, uh, for very often. Um, I can talk about that later. Um, what we can know from using the available data is that of the ships whose captains recorded sex ratio, 30% carried more adult women than men, and 53% carried more females than males, if you take into account children. Of the 337 voyages for which sex ratio is recorded, 309 include children. In these early voyages, adult men were not in the majority. None of this means that before 1700, African women were having a lot of babies in the new world, but it does mean that at this time, black women were both laborers and the conduits for manifesting racial capitalism. Finding these women is an archive problem that is ubiquitous for scholars of slavery and gender, but it also carries with it some very particular challenges for the early modern period, embedded as it is in a problem of knowledge production that defines both the discipline of history and the phantasmograms of early modern economies. Um, in 17th century uh, empiricism, I would argue, a whole lot has been lost. So I began a project of accounting for them. Um, an effort to know just how many women were transported before 1700 and ended up chasing ghosts. Haunted by the work performed by the presumption that women were of negligible importance in the history of early modern capitalism. Convinced that it is here in the interstices between irrelevance and the powerful evidence to the contrary that something really important is revealed. Um, we know we remind ourselves that Africans had to be constantly made into slaves. African women came to signify something more than just the hard labor and the sexual labor that they performed. It is in their reproductive capacities that they mark the economic logics of um, race and hereditary racial slavery, that they were forced to make slaves. The unwillingness on the part of contemporary traders, purchasers, legislators, and the like to record the presence of these women is a problem of knowledge formation as much as it is um, evidence of structural violence. So what can we learn about racial capitalism's relationship to kinship from the women whose subjugation is rooted in the claim, the woman, the women, that they produce nothing other than life, bare life, a claim thrust upon these women aboard a slave ship even as she descends into madness and death with a child clutched in her arms. The ability to translate or convert biology into feeling and into affect is, I would argue, what makes us human. To build an economy on the claim that such a capacity was only the province of the few was an astonishing act of violence. Hereditary racial slavery made the mark of the mother a death sentence for her child. It turned the act of birth into an act of death. And in the words of Saidia Hartman, it turned the birth canal into a middle passage. My sojourn in the archives is an attempt to put flesh and bones on the apparition of the mad woman on board that slave ship so as to understand the overlap between her death, her child's birth, and the birth of capitalist modernity. So, racial capitalism. <coughs> Much has been said recently about capitalism and slavery. Fueled as the editors at Boston Review wrote by the conclusion that, quote, Marx's history of capital is incorrect. Capitalism did not originate in 18th century British factories, but began with the slave trade, close quote. We've begun to mobilize, we, historian scholars, many of whom you have heard or will hear in the coming uh, uh, weeks, um, we've begun to mobilize the concept of racial capitalism to mark our reanimation 
of the over overlapping origins of slavery and capitalism, and we do so primarily through the work of Cedric Robinson. Robinson introduced the concept of racial capitalism in 1983 in his Black Marxism, The Making of the Black Radical Tradition. There he argued that the conditions from which early capitalism developed required the pre-existence of ideas of human hierarchy that would sub subsequently become kind of categories under the concept of race. Um, he, uh, through such a lens, the existence <coughs> of slavery at the onset of early modern capitalist formations is neither coincidental nor incidental. Rather, capitalism, which he termed racial capitalism to capture this process, depended on slavery. On the, on the violence of racial hierarchy and on imperialism. He mounted his evidence about the concurrence of race and capitalism using the reorganization of labor practices that were predicated on ideas of ethnic or regional particularity in medieval Europe um, and on what he called um, antagonistic differences directed at pre-racialized subjects such as the Jews, the Irish, the Slavs, the Roma, and others. So that's the kind of the piece of black Marxism that I think a lot of people skip to get to the, to the, to the later parts, that, that, that first part of the book. Um, Robinson's provocation situates racial capitalism as part and parcel of the emergence of modernity, as coeval with the origins of enlightenment man, and thus he demands a reconsideration of the categories that attend the modern or that, that attend enlightenment, um, beginning with capitalism, but including secularism, individualism, the new ways of writing and thinking and enacting governance, all of the phenomena that understood as signaling modernity. Race is entwined with the very forces of knowledge production that enable us to ask questions about change over time to begin with. And so part of what um, Robinson's work does for me is it demands that we kind of step outside of the structures of meaning that have defined our fields of inquiry in order to see how the thought processes of those propelled into the Black Atlantic, both were framed and reframed by what became the modern. In my work, it means asking how, for enslaved women in the 16th and the 17th century, slave traders' presumptions that they were kinless get folded into historians' explanations for why they are so hard to find. So explicitly or implicitly, recognizing um, African women, men, and children as members of families as humans defined by their location in kin networks was dangerous. The capacity to imagine an Atlantic future upon which wealth was produced through, the labors, through laborers who were marked as such by their racial inheritance depended on the repudiation of kinship, on the claim that African women had the capacity for reproduction stripped of its social meaning. To fully recognize African women as mothers would threaten the phantasmogram on which a massive economy was being constructed. For slave buyers and slave traders who left the records on which our history depend, it was imperative to obscure the degree to which they used the bodies of enslaved women to both define who is enslavable and also to demarcate their own personhood. Ship captains and crew and settlers in the Americas alike viewed enslaved women as valid outlets for sexual release and did so with a fairly clear understanding um, from the very beginning, that should children be born from such actions, slave owners' balance sheets would be enlarged, not their families. This, too, was something that accompanied the definitional logics of racial slavery rather than something that preceded it. Um, in 15th century Europe, enslaved women's labors routinely involved the expectation of sexual service, and I mean women who were enslaved in Europe, other Europeans. Um, uh, but the children of enslaved Berbers, Slavs, or Muslims were often understood as members of the slave owners or the father's family, right? That's a key difference between early medieval forms of slavery and what's going to emerge in the transatlantic slave trade. That notion of those children being incorporated into the, to the slave owner's family shifted with the imposition of race as the condition of enslavement. In that case, Africans are defined as unassimilable, another one of those words, um, even as the sexual services of enslaved women continue to be the burden of their condition. Um, this reality is indeed part of what constitutes the racial mark of enslavability as early as the beginning of the 16th century. The disavowal of paternity, 
which is clearly linked to the inevitability of all black women's children being exposed to the marketplace, is what makes hereditary racial slavery legible. And I, I can unpack some of this a little bit more in questions, but basically what I'm trying to do is think through what creates the moment at which, what creates the many moments in which um, race and, and the inevitability of some people's some people always being enslavable, which is not to say that they are all enslaved, but they all could be enslaved, versus other people who are seen as not enslavable. And where does that category um, come in, to, like where do we see it sort of coming together? So rationalizing the sale and distribution of human beings demanded the suppression of kinship to the arithmetic of the marketplace. The work of race, as an organizing concept of labor, hierarchy, and colonial extraction drew, of course, on concepts of culture and prejudice to give it legs. But in our attention to and debates around the role of culture and religion as like the fertile ground on which racial prejudice took root, I think we have sometimes ignored both the marketplace as a place of economy and culture and the role of enslaved women in producing it as such. Not, mind you, we haven't ignored the influence of economics as a coherent field that fuels the turn to the slave trade. Winthrop Jordan famously posited in 1968 that the move to chattel slavery in Virginia was a, quote, unthinking decision predicated on a racism that made the turn to black slaves easy when the need for labor compelled it, close quote. Here, racism underpins that which is unthought in a gesture that, that Jordan uh, uh, disavows and one that has propelled a huge amount of scholarship in unpacking the whole kind of question of where, where do we put the history of racial ideology in the history of slavery. Um, but the way that the Atlantic marketplace is itself kind of simultaneous with forced labor um, that the way that economy and economic rationality emerge as conceptual frames alongside the notion of kind of extractable and inherited categories of labor, that I think still demands attention. The transformation of sovereign people into slaves, even as it was rooted in a complex web, web of um, you know, diplomacy and kingship and faith, all of that, um, it took place in the context of emerging landscapes of economic gain well before Virginia planters reluctantly turned to slavery. To imagine that such a turn or a conversion was a simple manifestation of European prejudice is to situate the move itself as affect rather than calculus. If we presume that Europeans simply felt that Africans should be enslaved and to locate that feeling only in like animus or fear or the illogic of religious prejudice, <coughs> I think we fail to understand where sla racial slavery was situated and how it got there. Um, race obviously reflects and refracts older notions of the other that are rooted in religion and language and wealth and sovereignty, absolutely. But it adheres, I think, to enslaved men and women so as to produce a seemingly infinite pool of laborers a continent full of nothing more than Moors, blacks, and slaves, and full through the actions of African women. In 1447, in a letter sent to Genoa, Antoine Malfante, um, a man about whom we know nothing, um, but there it is, I'll talk about that as well, um, conflated the market and slaves with sexual depravity quite explicitly. Following his claim that slaves were sold, quote, at a very low price after being captured in internecine wars among, quote, the blacks, Malfanti wrote, quote, these people who cover the land in multitudes are in carnal acts like the beasts. The father has knowledge of his daughter, the son of his sister. They breed greatly, for a woman bears up to five at a birth, close quote. He then turned to cannibalism and, and illiteracy. Nor, quote, nor can he, nor, he wrote, can it be doubted that they are eaters of human flesh, for many people have gone hence into their country. They are unlettered and without books. His letter returns again and again to the vast populations of the land um, and, their, and the role of female fecundity in producing a population that was so big it was without knowledgeable boundaries. And it was there, it was in the kind of, and he uses the language of teeming, a sort of notion of teeming population that he, um, he kind of side 
rolls into claims about um, cannibalism and illiteracy and the, 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 a, a, an inability or an or incapacity to count. That's another piece that, that comes up in these texts. Um, as he linked the spheres of population, market, and sex, Malfante offered an early look um, at how individual Europeans were invested in discursively producing an understanding of Africans as overpopulous due to women's uncontrolled sexual prowess and without rational practices. In the travel narratives of the 16th and 17th century, European writers position African women as vectors of overabundant chaos. They are part of what defines Africans as indistinguishable population, as unregulated, as fungible, and as outside the category of kin. So claims of indelible difference began to emerge alongside of incontrovertible evidence to the contrary. And I just want to say, like, there's, there are, the, the I'm, I'm talking about, I'm talking about ideology, but I'm also um, talking about how ideology gets linked to economic practice, um, and, and how that economic practice and that ideology always uh, presents contradictions uh, to those people who are, um, who are, who are availing themselves of the market of slaves, or as Walter Johnson has argued, have imagined themselves as one day availing themselves of, a, of, of, of being a slave owner. Um, so the slave trade was inaugurating something quite new, something rooted in finance, commerce, economy, and in reproducing notions of inherited enslavability in ways that had not been seen before, and thus in ways that required an entirely new formulation. So the organizing principles of intimacy and economy could only come together in the like gaps or the interstices of knowing and not knowing, in the contradictory spaces in which claims that Africans weren't human occupied the exact same space as profoundly human interactions, communication, copulation, all of the ways in which Europeans and Africans are encountering each other. Um, for those watching the rationalities of racial slavery cohere, um, even, for example, from the relative safety of the Portuguese court, the transformation of people who were embedded in kin groups and communities into commodity was actually at times quite jarring. The enormity of the violation that was taking place was sometimes impossible to suppress. So in the 15th century, the royal chronicler to King Alfonso V, um, Zorada, uh, wrote in a manner um, that indicates that for him, the inherent kind of viciousness of this manner of human calculus was not entirely lost. He described the arrival of what we now understand to be the first voyage of a slave ship from the African coast to the European market in 1444. As the 250 African captives were unloaded on the docks, he described their grief. And so this is a, a, so I have a few lines here. Quote, Though we could not understand the words of their language, the sound of it right well accorded with the measure of their sadness. But to increase their suffering still more, there now arrived those who had charge of the division of the captives, and who began to separate one from another in order to make equal partition. And then was it needful to part fathers from sons, husbands from wives, brothers from brothers. The mothers clasped their other children in their arms and threw themselves flat on the ground with them, receiving blows with little pity for their own flesh, if only they might not be torn from them." Zorada's language, division, equal partitions, the way that he contrasts those words um, with fathers, mothers, sons, and wives, conveys the essential conflict enacted by hereditary enslavement, that between market and kin. For Zorada, the pathos of enslavement was best evoked by the contrast between the kind of divisional rationality of distributing merchandise and a mother's willingness to sacrifice herself in order to protect her child. His language marks the crucial problem space. Still, this um, episode is an interruption. In a volume of more than 150 modern pages, it's the only place where you get that kind of, um, of a sympathetic uh, tone. Um, the emphasis is primarily on the Portuguese's success and failure in capturing Moors, men, women, and children who are discursively reduced to the object in the sentences, not the subject, and are not rendered with empathy or pathos. 
Still, in the starkest possible terms, Zurata and his readers saw the challenge posed by human cargo to those attempting to situate them as commodities in a market. How do you force the logics of commerce into the affective space of family? Even more importantly, they saw the efforts of those men and women to reject this process, to interrupt their commodification through a refusal to remain categorized in equal partitions. Fathers and sons, or wives and husbands, mothers and children, refusing to succumb, holding on to one another, disrupting the partition, and, as the inevitable occurred, wailing out their protests. These relationships were clearly visible to the onlookers on the port, and they were irrefutably essential to the captives. The disavowal of kinship as a core component of the logic of racial slavery does not then emerge fully formed. Um, as Robin Blackburn argued more than 15 years ago, in the laboratory that was the 16th century Caribbean, so 50 years after this moment that Zerada describes, um, the fact that enslaved people had both the capacity and the legal route to form families and to bolster freedom claims through family was widely understood. Women and men born on the West and West Central African coast maintained their linguistic and community-based identities for decades in Latin America and the Caribbean, sometimes obtaining their freedom, always mounting irrefutable arguments against their dispossession um, through their presence in and recapping of, of, excuse me, and recrafting of Catholicism, the market, their skilled craft work, and their complex negotiation of slave owners' power, the healing arts, and the production of families through formal and informal marriages. All of that is the, is the if there are any um, early modern Latin Americanists in the room, like that's the stuff of the, of the 16th century um, uh, archive in Mexico and Peru um, and the Spanish Caribbean, the ways in which African people kind of retained clearly, and not only retained their identities, but in ways that the that slave owners recognized, like, and named them as such. So I'm not saying that this kind of, that this, this transformation of people into commodities is somehow, you know, is, 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 is started and completed in one act, nor just as, just because the, the, the ideas of race are being introduced at a certain point, that those are complete, um, but they, but they are important, and I'm arguing that they are um, profoundly gendered. Um, in any case, 16th century slave owners bore witness to the production of kinship and community formation among Africans and their descendants. Communities um, at the time were characterized by closeness and intimacy between indigenous peoples, Africans, and Europeans, um, and were marked by the languages, belief systems, and bodies that testified um, to the multiple exchanges that were possible between and across allegedly separate people, right, and still. I'm, of course, primarily interested in what being barred from kinship meant for women, and not only because of my commitments as a social historian. What I want to unearth and convey, while I want to unearth and convey something of the material contours of their lives, there is more. There is my conviction that by looking with them, we can discern something that has eluded us. At the risk of stating the obvious, how can we possibly understand a labor system harnessed to the inherited mark of racial dispossession without clarifying how those closest to its inheritance were positioned? In the aggregate, let me reiterate, women were outnumbered in the slave trade by men and children, but in the first two centuries of the trade, women and men were relatively balanced among the captives. New evidence of the first wave of slave trade into the Spanish Americas is particularly important for the study of gender and slavery, as all extant evidence points to the fact that more women were captured and sold to the Americas before 1700 than in later um, decades of the trade. Uh, the presence of those women is, is made manifest by all sorts of things. So for example, in 16th century Ecuador, records of slave sales indicate nearly equal numbers of men and women purchased to labor in the city of Quito. Broader population figures suggest at least 40% of enslaved Africans were female. In Lima, census and tax records puts the populations of um, both black and mulatto women at just over 50% by 1600. In Peru, um, more broadly, the presence of those women was so ubiquitous that as historian Tamara Walker has shown, policing their movements and their garb, what they were wearing, became a crucial aspect of, of, of 17th century Spanish colonial law. 
there were female majorities on the island of Barbados for the entirety of slavery. There were near equal numbers of men and women at times in South Carolina, and starting in the late um, 1690s, female majorities in New York City and lonely enslaved. Um, we have unthought the role of these women at the birth of Atlantic slavery and of the meaning of their presence, despite some evident clues as to why they were there to begin with. So why were they there to, at the beginning? Um, even prior to the turn to Africa, Europeans were quite familiar with enslaving women. Uh, there was nothing particularly uncomfortable about the use of lesser status women to provide hard labor for elite European households. From Italy to Iberia to England, women defined as different in the ways that Robinson um, talks about, uh, worked in European households and fields, laying the groundwork for the presumption that gendered notions of protection were only extended to women in the families of property-owning men. But as we've seen, sometimes those women are producing children who become part of those families. And that, that creates a, a, a kind of gray area on, in terms of the definition, the way that uh, gender and slavery are interacting in this period prior to the transatlantic slave trade. Once the fixity of racial inheritance adhered to the concept of slave, something else changed. Um, enslaved women become sort of erased from view, and the presence of women among the captives in the inaugural shipments of enslaved Africans to Europe and then to the Americas um, was obvious. We know that they were there, but the, uh, the willingness of slave owners and travelers, et cetera, to talk about them or to include them in kind of their um, explicit references to what was happening on slave plantations uh, starts to shift, and our ability to see them um, uh, however, this blindness induced by the accounting practices of ship captains and slave owners alike, I think is saturated with meaning. Um, that meaning is linked to ideas about what you can buy and sell and how things are, are valued and exchanged. Um, it's linked to concepts of what is rational and what's irrational um, and what is quantifiable. European writers located the African continent through the alchemy of monstrosity, heathenism, unregulated trade. We've seen that in the writings of Malfante that I read. Um, these encounters are full of women who mark the presence of rendering Africa into a legitimate source of Europe, of, of a legit, legitimate source for European plunder. Women's disordered and disordering presence did important work distinguishing them from, and their descendants from more familiar European female forced laborers and offering up a strategy for marketing a seemingly endless populace of African slaves. The capacity of African women to convey enslavability to their children and thus involuntarily to convey them to the market, this is where reproduction and racial capitalism intersect. The notion of enslavability was attached to the reproductive capacity of a woman perceived as fundamentally different from the household for which she labored, even as her sexual vulnerability to the slave owner testified to her sameness. It is that space of corporeal, of bodily contradiction that I'm trying to think through, as it's precisely that space that positions the Europeans who became slave traders, slave buyers and slave owners, to perceive African women and men as legitimate commodities, as exchangeable on the basis of a mark of difference that was allegedly indelible even as it was breachable. Many scholars of race in the early modern period, Cedric Robinson, Hortense Spiller, Sylvia Winter, Kim Hall, Herman Bennett, among others, have explored the ways that racialized ideologies of difference in Europe are firmly connected to the process by which Africans get slotted into the category of the enslavable. But less attention, I think, um, uh, less attended, I think, is the precise work that the origin of the, of the bind between race and reproduction performed in moving racial slavery into the heart of early modern capitalism. So the race reproduction bind is a phrase that um, uh, literary theorist um, Elise Weinbaum uses to talk about the, in, the impossibility of thinking race without thinking reproduction. Like we can't, she, she argues, and I, I, we can talk about this as well if you want to, that you can't, like the concept of race is, uh, requires, is dependent on the concept of reproduction because it's about a heritability, it's about a mark that you, that, that, is, that, that is passed down. Um, and it is that piece of, 
the connection between um, racialized idea, ideas of difference and and how sort of technology, the way that race becomes a technology that legitimizes the turn to Africa for labor. Um, it's that connection that I think we still need some more time on. Um, I, need, I think we need to more capaciously consider the connection between women's reproductive capacities and the ability to both name and imagine race as doing the work to produce some human beings as nothing um, other than enslavable. So what emerges in the 16th and 17th century are new regimes of thought that displace notions of complex communities, right? The kind of complex communities um, that are described on the West African coast, that are experienced on the West African coast, and that are described, albeit like riven through with new dynamics of power and exploitation in the Americas. Let's return um, to the women forcibly separated from their children and spouses on the dock um, in 1444 to the woman who walks herself to death and madness. The, those women's refusal to give up their kinship ties to the, to the mm, anonymizing, anonymizing, <laughs> how's that for a word? To the anonymizing record books um, and to the mathematical division of the slave traders suggests a foundational counter narrative to commodification among the enslaved. For Robinson, this is the black radical tradition. Um, and for him, the manifestations of black radicalism were based in a commitment on the part of the enslaved to rejecting the terms on which their captivity was founded. Um, and he, he writes of this as a preservation of what he calls an ontological totality, right? A sense of wholeness that was not predicated on Africans' experience of the American plantation, but rather on a total rejection of their lot. Robinson writes, the black radical tradition cast doubt on the extent to which capitalism penetrated and reformed social life, and on its ability to create entirely new categories of human experience stripped bare of the historical consciousness embedded in culture. The conviction that capitalism's penetration had limits in the lives of people whose labors produced capitalist economies is at the crux of the matter for Robinson and in my current work for myself. It poses a still unanswered question. In the face of the captures, transports, and sales, the imposed labor regimes that defined life for the African women who became the commodity form on which Atlantic economies were founded, where do you find that wholeness? Where do you locate ontological totality? Where is it preserved? As I look to the early colonial archives, what I find is a conceptual space in which we can glimpse the roots of such preservations of self and the roots of dissent, the nascent articulation of what's going to become a diasporic theory of power, a recognition on the part of the enslaved and on enslaved women particularly that the marketing of their bodies is nothing less than a systematic denial of their kinship ties and as such must be refused. I see it in the actions of women like Dorothy Angola and Maria Portuguese who in the 1640s used the courts to try to place their children in indentureships after the Dutch West India Company used those children to hold their parents in a state of half freedom in colonial New York. I see it in the court case of Elizabeth Keyes, the daughter of an African woman and an Englishman who argued in 1652 that she had inherited freedom from her father, even as the Virginia House of Burgesses moved to insist that children such as, her, such as herself could only inherit um, enslavement from their mothers. And I see it in the ubiquitous growth of maroon communities across the West Indies and Latin America, where colonial governors attempted to situate maroon women only as slaves and victims of rampaging maroon men and never as maroons themselves who were growing those communities through birth. In 1683, the English, let's find, the English slave ship Dorothy arrived at the Ghana coast and was loaded with 135 Negroes, some of which were men and some were women, close quote. During the time that the ship remained at anchor, the captain was unable to stop the captives from using tobacco. He likely thought it was a harmless concession, especially because other, because other ship captains let captives smoke. But in this instance, it proved, it proved disastrous. Quote, a Negro woman between deck of the said ship who had fire with her 
did fling the same pipe lighted from her, which did fall into the hole of the said ship where the gunpowder was, and instantly the ship thereupon was blown up." Close quote. A handful of Englishmen survived and testified to the care that they had always taken to keep the powder safe. Their story was crafted to indict the woman's carelessness and issue a warning to other captains of other ships. But a crucial question is all but ignored. Was her act one of carelessness or of care? Mm -hmm. Having lived in proximity to English slave trading and firepower for decades, might she not have designed to bring an explosive and liberatory end to the people captured on board that ship? Having experienced firsthand the violence of capture, might she not have anticipated the violence to come and made a strategic decision to bring it to a dramatic end, even as she braced herself for the final draw of sweet tobacco smoke from her pipe? What can we hear if we listen to her with care? In the larger project from which this talk is drawn, I am suggesting that there is a corporeal, there's a bodily foundation to both the recognition of the enormity of what racial slavery meant and to its refusal. One felt in the body, one viscerally accessed by enslaved and free black women. I make this argument from a range of sources, some of which I've gestured to today. Those that describe women's capture and transport while pregnant. Those that describe women's use of the courts and the church to protect their children's future. Those that recognize the internal growth of maroon villages. These bits of evidence are inadequate, of course, but they lead me to consider carefully the extent to which claims of natural dispossession rooted in the bodies of these women would naturally be perceived by these self-same women. It is a suggestion that builds on Robinson's notion of the desire for, the, for ontological totality, but that departs from him in crucial ways. For Robinson, the urge towards the rejection of enslavement is rooted in an African culture, in the maintenance of a sense of self across the Middle Passage that carries with it the urge and capacity to collectively reject enslavement entirely. These are the roots of black radicalism. But what is this if not a reclamation of kinship? And might kinship offer a less static view of Africa and of what was both past and past? Past with <laughs> My formulation of the roots of black radicalism is one that draws from feminist scholars, that develops a practice of reading the archive that grows out of a philosophy of history in which we understand that reproduction is inextricably linked to the history of racial slavery and its afterlives and that, and that, that uh, many have called a black feminist philosophy of history. This is an archival practice traceable in Angela Davis's 1972 article on black women in the community of slaves, and it's one that's enacted by Deborah Gray White, by Hilary Bethel, by myself, by Stephanie Camp, by Marisa Puentes, Sasha Turner, Cindy Hartman, Imani Perry, and Catherine McKittrick, many, many others. Namely, the practice of assiduously centering women's lives to illuminate the broader workings of power, resistance, political economy, and knowledge production that are at work in Atlantic slavery. Here, I have mobilized black, a black feminist philosophy of history in at least two ways. One, as a practice of reading in which I am engaged. But the other is in taking seriously the crash of recognition on the part of a captive African woman that her reproductive capacities have been forcibly and violently tethered to a marketplace that feeds on her own destruction. What racial capitalism does in its starkest terms is to introduce the human body to the marketplace. And thus, in its starkest terms, it situates African women at the heart of the structural logic of the business of slavery. This isn't a metaphor. Africa, actual women are laboring, af, excuse me, actual women were laboring throughout the Americas. And equally importantly, slave owners were conceiving of black people as produced for markets. If, as political scientist Neil Roberts argues, the technology of racial slavery is predicated on the effort to ensure that, quote, the slave must never know what it means to be a person, close quote, then women whose reproductive potential lay bare the racialized logic of hereditary and hierarchical claims to authority undid racial slavery's technology in small but persistent and profoundly generative ways. Not only through their proximity to marketplaces, but also through their recognition of the ways that the market was made manifest through their bodies. If the roots of racial capitalism are entwined in the emergence of the race reproduction bind and the harnessing of African women's reproductive capacities to the economies of the transatlantic slave trade, then so too are the origins of black radicalism 
Those origins offer, as Amani Perry has suggested, we need alternative grammars for liberation that are rooted in embodied truths. Those grammars are formed in the corporeal earthiness of birth and death and the middle passages that relentlessly took place inside enslaved women's bodies. They are the grammars of sanity in the face of madness, of care in carelessness around a ship's hold full of gunpowder and kinfolk. In the refusal to relinquish a child to the market, a refusal felt so powerfully and clearly that it wore you down to nothing and left you dead with your claim to family and to kin clenched forever in your arms. Entire talk, thank you. Um, I, I my I kind of two questions, most of which are just questions for you to expound on mm -hmm. things you mentioned, um, particularly the maroon society. Mm -hmm. um, I, I I am a historian of Brazil, and mm -hmm. so um, in your book project, do, do you reach into the? I, I I don't do very much in Brazil, to be mm -hmm. honest. Um, I'm I I have a more um, kind of careful discussion of marine communities in the English Atlantic world, mm -hmm. and then in North America a little bit. And um, but I draw from some secondary literature on on Brazil and on that way that women are always described as being the um, like the object of raids. You know, like that, that maroons raid and take slave women and never, so I'm interested in the way that um, certain kind of descriptors are, are presumed to be men and, and, and women are left out so that maroon, even, even when you have moments when like maroon uh, communities gather in their censuses and it's obvious that there are women and children and there are children, Right? These are these are places of, of community growth of, of what demographers call natural increase, but like colonial governors just sort of they both list them and then they, like dismiss them, ignore them. So that that's one of the kind of places of erasure that I talk a little bit more carefully about. Um, well, I mean, I guess it kind of links into that question, and I'd love to hear more about the North American variety. Um, but I mean, you're also talking about uh, particularly when you gave the example of something Lisbon, Lisbon, Portugal. It was one of the slave women whose name, sorry. Oh, right, Lisbon. Maria Portugal. There it is, yes. okay. Yes. Um, but, um, you know, I mean, the fact that she claimed that she inherited uh, her freedom from her father mm -hmm. and versus this dominant uh, mm -hmm. inheritance of slave, enslavement from her mother. Um, and so I guess just the, this, the, what came to mind is the, the conflict of a matrilineal society mm -hmm. um, versus a patriarchal and patrilineal society. Mm -hmm. and, and how, I mean, in any of those cases, how is that articulated and or um, is that kind of, or I don't know, of what are your thoughts on, yeah. on that conflict? So, it's a really good question. I, I, I haven't, I haven't done enough research on to sort of identify matrilineality as a as like a, a lived experience um, on the African coast. Um, what I've been most because in it's part because of the way that these moments of, of parenting kind of emerge in the records that are always isolated. They're always like an individual woman who appears in court or an individual kind of birth record um, or marriage record in which a woman names her children and names the father in order to try to kind of protect them in some way or the other. I think that it's a really um, important thread, and I think that it's a place that um, that I that I, I actually really appreciate the question because I do have a little bit of time. Um, but I because I think that it's part of sort of imagining that there's another worldview here in which um, descent through the mother is actually really important um, and is the way in which the community understands itself to be kind of moving for have, to be having a history and a lineage. Um, and so, if anything, it the the ways in which slave owners kind of claims making is erasing that um, is only kind of amplified in the way that it's being experienced. So that the larger argument that 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 there's a that 
that people understand what violence is being done by claiming that their children have no patrimony. You know what I mean? Like all of that gets, I think, amplified. Um, so turning the mark of the mother into the reason why they're legitimately enslaved, rather than into um, into an, you know another kind of inheritance. Yeah. Final comment yeah, on yeah, that. Yeah, um, just to say, like I, I guess that's why I specifically asked the question about maroon society, yeah. though, to see if if that. It dominates, or if, if that mm -hmm. kind of social structure uh, manifests more mm -hmm. in these maroon societies. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah. It's a good, that, that I'm not going to be able to answer that. <laughs> <laughs> but I think, it's a, I think it's an important one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, back to Queen and Queen Charlotte, how she arose, because this is um, her, her name. Mm -hmm. But now the Queen Charlotte has 11 children, mm -hmm. and the Queen has like 100,000 acres in South Africa. Mm -hmm. She's the heir of this mark, but she was forgotten that mm -hmm. she's black. Mm -hmm. That was black in the at one time. I, I don't know that specific example, but I know, I think that what Part, there are all of these places of contradiction, right? There, there are, uh, there, are pl there are people of African descent who do successfully move out of the category of enslaved and, and regain freedom in the Americas. There are also, obviously, many people in, on the West African coast who are not um, you know, are not enslavable to, and they're not victims of, of enslavement at the hands well, of Well, in, in a way she was mm -hmm. because she could, she said that she could not tell, could not when when um, when the revolution war came out, mm -hmm. she could not free her people. Mm -hmm. She wasn't a queen to the Africans. Mm -hmm. She was a queen to the Europeans, mm -hmm. and this was in her own words. Mm -hmm. Well, I I think that there are there are I think that there are individuals individual stories who of people who have whose experience is not kind of embedded in the in in the the like the logic of slavery that I'm describing. Mm -hmm. um, and and it sounds to me like this is a person who who had a different who navigated this in a different way. Um, so and I'm I'm very interested in those people because there are so few right, right? there are so mm -hmm. few women whose histories we know. But I am mean, just mm -hmm. going to what you were saying is that here we are, the mother of mankind, mm -hmm. but here we are, is enslaved in a way ourselves by giving birth. Yeah, yeah, y you know. yeah, and absolutely. Politically, and it, yes, yeah, yes. This is what I yeah. point now. Yeah, no, I think you're absolutely right. Yeah. You're absolutely right. Yeah, thank you. You're thank welcome. you for that. Yeah. yeah, I had a sort of similar question. Maybe it's outside of the scope of this talk. I don't know, but. As I'm thinking through the sort of uh, black Marxist approach of thinking of women as uh, producing enslavable beings, mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering about how maybe abortion does or doesn't tie into that. Mm -hmm. Because like the same we were describing how one might blow herself up in a shit mm -hmm. is a refusal to participate in that process. Mm -hmm. And perhaps some of the sort of like conservative resistance to allowing women to control mm -hmm. how to have children. Mm -hmm. It's also coming from this place of like, well, we gotta re refuse to have yeah. children in an environment where yeah. they have no economic power. Mm -hmm. So like, what, or no, no power that's not economically tethered to a slave owner. Right. There's, there's been a, there's a, as many of you in the room might know, there's a whole literature on sort of the degree to which women did or did not exercise what um, Aptek are called like gynecological revolt. Right, um, and it's not. It's a as you can imagine. It's a hard. Uh, it's a hard story to tell. Sasha Turner has done really, really important work on um, reproduction in Jamaica, um, and the ways in which uh, uh, birth rates rise after slavery is over. Um, that suggests that women are are doing something to to avoid conception or. Um, avoid reproduction. There's, but the but the counter 
evidence to that is the ways that labor on sugar plantation kind of destroys fertility. So the ability, the capacity for women to have to get pregnant and to carry birth to term is really hampered by the physical, the brutality of working in the sugar fields. So it's a hard, but I think it's a really important question. And at the very least, we know that slave owners are, are watching reproduction and that enslaved women are experienced, and, and, and one of the things that I, as I'm speaking, I realize I'm not really, I'm not necessarily talking about women who actually give birth. I'm talking about the ways in which you're cognizant of what your, should you give birth, what that would mean, right? Because in fact, birth rates are very low in this time. They're very, you know, it's not, it's for all sorts of reasons. Um, but there are there are children being born. There are children being born on ships. There are children being born in the Americas. And um, part of what I'm trying to kind of get at is how that um, how that physical experience or the, the 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 capacity to have that experience, whether you do or not, is part of a of a political. Of, of a sentience, it's part of you know we. I think we always fail to think of women as having like critical enslaved women as having critical apparatuses, like that they're you know they're going to courts. They're not like they they are thinking through what's happening to them. And sometimes, I would argue they're blowing up a ship. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. Following up on that, I just I really liked um, what you were saying, and it was response. I think you were talking about in response to kind of Neil Roberts and. Mm -hmm. Lack of recognition, and so we're covering in these archives these moments of cognizance, or what we've been sort of these flashes of recognition, mm -hmm. and and that in itself being a form of resistance. Mm -hmm. Like I recognize that my um, um, capacity for reproduction, mm -hmm. whether or not, like you said, it's, you know, I've actually given birth, but mm -hmm. that um, enslaved African women would that's that's a set a, a form of kind of um, resistance mm -hmm. to the system mm -hmm. that asks. For a lack of cognizance, and I feel like it's tied to how you talk about the work of numeracy mm -hmm. and um, and slave, owner, slave owners' numeracy as a process of no, both knowing and not knowing, and a process of separating out the um, um, realm of affect. Yeah. Um, so there's like numeracy is a way of sort of you know the people on the ship and you can count, but it's also a way of not knowing. Mm -hmm. And so that idea of kind of conceptualizing all of this at once, mm -hmm. you know, and but, I mean, I guess the question that I had for you was um, about this concept of, of numeracy and also just the mm -hmm. way, like you mentioned, Caitlin Rosenthal, mm -hmm. and, you know, mm -hmm. talking about just numeracy at the, at the heart of this, like, work of um, creating racial capitalism. Mm -hmm. um, but then also this recognition, too, that that's a, I mean, I guess I was wondering if you see it as numeracy in general mm -hmm. as a technology mm -hmm. um, or if you see um, it's a particular... Um, type of numeracy. Because these um, um, women coming aboard these ships and being accounted like men would have had their own forms of numeracy. Mm -hmm. So it seems like to me the opposition between like embodied affect mm -hmm. and numeracy as a technology uh, might be kind of a false one. It's maybe more about um, different forms of numeracy. Mm -hmm. You know, one that participates in this is the vowel yeah. and and one that um, gets not recorded and you know just different. I mean, obviously, like there, there's a, there's a form of numeracy that's happening. But I also think that all these studies about like the tide of arithmetic to slavery are forgetting that there's multiple types yeah. of that these people have their own forms of numeracy. Okay. Chapter two <laughs> um, is it, it's so yes, yeah. um, but you're you're totally right that I did that in the paper in in ways that I that I wasn't keeping track of. So I, I really appreciate the question. So the larger project is really saying like there is that part of what is happening in this moment is like a concretizing for European ideas about about trade and value. There's a all sorts of debates about currency, et cetera. Um, and one of the ways in which they um, articulate their own claims about the solidity of value that adheres to gold and to enslaved people is through erasing 
systems of numeracy and value on the African yes. coast. So you have you there you have travelers who go. You have descriptions of gold merchants, for example, um, in Senegambia that are real that are that are early, that are before the kind of explosion of the slave trade. That talk about like the 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 really like careful and minute calculations that. African gold merchants are performing. They describe the scales and how the the way that they that gold that the that the trader the merchants sort of uh, maintain gold sort of value over really long distances. It's a trans-Sahara trade, etc. This is all described, right? And then 50 years later, in the exact same place. A, a Portuguese man says that Africans can't count past the number 10; that they need their feet in order to get to 20. You know what I mean? Like, so it's a it's a very calculated claim about irrationality, about like population, teeming population. There's all of these, all of this work. But you're absolutely right that of course part of what all captives bring with them is like a deep familiarity with the marketplace and a recognition. So the other crash of recognition that I described in the book is is being sold. Like this is not a something that's beyond comprehension. Like so, I th I think I'm really I feel that I'm really in a convert like in a conversation in my head. Although we did go to school together um, with Stephanie Smallwood around like what it means to be commodified. Like ha what happens that kind of turns a group of people into a cargo, right? And I think that her kind of really beautifully and careful sort of thinking through what it means to be on a ship where you can't see the horizon when that or you can't see land the disorientation and and what that means for people who um, have navigated rivers but not oceans right um, I think that's so important on the other hand I think that there is a deep history of marketing a really complicated long distance marketing that women are um, crucial to on on through you know throughout Senegambia and and Ghana and, and Togo and, and what was then called the Gold Coast right like so so they're bringing a really tangible way of kind of assessing value mm -hmm. and of currency and all of that and so they that's part of the corporeal recognition it's like I understand what you're doing to my body because of course I know about fungibility I know about currency I know about um, what's what's tradable, right? And you're doing that to me, and you're doing that to us, and you're doing that to the child that I could bear. So I really thank you very much for the question, because I, I see how that falls out of the paper now. Um, hopefully it doesn't fall out of the book. <laughs> yeah. Um, thanks for coming. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Um, I have a question about the sort of the logic that characterized African women as um, monstrous in a way, right? Mm -hmm. And it makes me think of the end of Mama's Baby Papa's Maybe where she talks about, um, it's sort of a little talk about part of an essay that everybody talks about. Mm -hmm. But um, she talks about there being some, some potential in embracing the monstrosity, mm -hmm. a female that has the power to name, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I wonder if, of course, as a historian, I'm sure you're careful not to project, um, you know, the historical subjects when you're studying, you know, into some future context or to um, approach them thematically in historiography. But um, do you think that amid those accusations of kinlessness, there is something a little rogue since black motherhood has been so maligned? Is there something that gestures towards embracing that monstrosity or some mm -hmm. area of potential? Um, not, I don't know how to explain it, maybe not designated by the strictures of motherhood that we think of as, as good or productive. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that's such a good question. I, I, I feel like part of what I was trying to do in laboring women was to sort of historicize motherhood and to suggest that part of what the logics of slavery might do is kind of reduce affective connection between mother and child, right? say that that's a space of danger and it's not logical to connect, right? Um, I think that there's, I don't, I think I've, I think that's not what I'm doing here. I'm more thinking about the, the legibility of those accusations. And I think that people can always take those accusations and 
turn them on their head or try to use them to their advantage. It is not, I think, the same thing as a kind of, yeah, I'm not, I don't know, you know, I, I don't know about you, but like I reread Mama's Baby Papa's maybe like twice a year, mm -hmm. and each time I'm like, oh, still didn't deal with this part of it, right? <laughs> um, it, I think it's an it's like a profoundly generative piece. Mm -hmm. And like it, if we could all write one thing like that, oh my <laughs> god. Um, but I think I think that there's something really um, there's something really to think about in the possibility of tr of turning that accusation of kinlessness back of like not not turning it back but rather of like using it, transforming it. And I think about all the work that's done on like um, queering the idea of family, right, et cetera. And I think that part of, you know, part of what historians of, um, of slavery and Afro-American life have always done, you know, the idea of fictive kin networks, the ways in which people kind of produce themselves as kin, even, even if they're, you know, not kin, right? Like, um, all of those things, I think, are, are, are kind of snatches of evidence of how important it is, how important the, 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 the accusation is in kind of trying to make this thing logical and how constantly that accusation is being um, refused, right? Like, the, you're like it's, no, it's, that's not what this is, right? And whether it's in these ways that I've emphasized here, which are very kind of bodily, like the clutching of the child, the, t you know, the turning your own body so that you get lashed so the child does not, like there are those moments that are, but I, but I also want to recognize that like for Zerata, for the, for the author, he's crafting that as a way to like make a point. Um, so I don't want to lose that, that it's a discursive act on his part. But by the same token, I think there's something really important there. And it's, and I, it's threaded through in all sorts of other places in the archive if you, if you look for it. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, I guess uh, building off that question, I'm thinking in terms of like a three pickings with uh, Ned Black and Black Madness, mm -hmm. uh, Lamar mm -hmm. Bruce mm -hmm. and uh, his writings on madness as well. Mm -hmm. And it, that as a site of resistance mm -hmm. and uh, potentially with like a Seppa's protection of her mm -hmm. beloved mm -hmm. uh, as another instance of mm -hmm. that. Like, yeah. Um, yeah, no, I mean, I think that's, ex so, so for me, for me, and I, do, again, this is such a, like, no, I do it in the book, um, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm really careful in that, in, in the way that I read the captain's description that she, that she was mad, that this was madness, I'm saying, like, no, this is not madness. This is the absence of madness. This is the this is the recognition on some metaphorical or corporeal level that like if I let go of this child, you know, we are we are we are doomed to the market. And so so death on board the ship makes more sense, right? And and so that's exactly what I'm interested in are those moments. So sometimes they're not it's not madness, right? Like the court cases are not about madness, they're about sort of strategic deployment of the tools that people have at hand. But I wanted to put those moments of, of, of madness and, and, and um, I wanted to put them in proximity to the logical ones, right? To, to think about what it is, because I, I feel like, I mean this whole thing originated with the problem that the social historian you know, we start with the demography. Like, if you're a social history, you're like, okay, I'm studying this place with these people, and there were this many of them, and they, you know, you start there. But if you can't start with that data, like, where do you start? And and that's part of what the archives of the slave trade do is they disorient us and they make it so we can't start. And therefore, and that's why I realized I said over and over again, knowledge production, knowledge production. Like, that's part of what I'm trying to get at here, which is like we're we who are historians or academics are like looking for a certain kind of evidence and that evidence is the afterlife of slavery, mm -hmm. right? So then we need to, you know, Saidiya Hartman says we need to derange the archives, right? That's also, that, that I need to write that down because that needs to be as well. <laughs> uh, but the, de the deranging of the archive is about the historian being mad, right? Mm -hmm. It's about the madness of the scholar who saying, rejecting the stricture of the archive. 
you know, and that's also what Marisa Fuentes does so brilliantly, right? Like it's like saying, okay, what do I do with this this imposition of 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 a of a of a this disciplining, mm -hmm. right? What do I do with that? So thank you. This is a fantastic talk. This is out of my area and out of my field, um, but I'm thinking about it sort of in the meta, and I think it's building a little bit off of what you were trying to get at as well, although I'm not versed in the literature. And, and that is you're uncovering something absolutely rich, right? You're coming in sideways at this evidence and trying to ferret something out. And what it seems to me that gets elevated and privileged are the acts of resistance, is the pipe dropping, and, and that being privileged as a success, mm -hmm. where we stand in an age where slavery ended and freedom began, mm -hmm. and those who didn't make it, mm -hmm. didn't make it through, mm -hmm. is it not privileging something that makes it difficult for all of us in the present mm -hmm. with the residual of moving through that whole passage, go, well, only the people who didn't make it really did the right thing. Mm -hmm. See, I think I'm, tr I mean, so it's funny, because I used to, I'm, you, they are I'm pointing at you. Yes, you yes. <laughs> um, started with a question that was that you use the word resistance a lot, and and I'm not. I, I try not to use the word resistance because I worry that it sets up this kind of um, it sets up this liberal notion of, of those who attain freedom, right? And and that and, and it and it sort of situates um, certain kinds of actions along a trajectory that's sort of moving us ever closer to to freedom and to emancipation, right, for the whole. And so I, I, I guess... That's where we go. Right, exactly. And I guess I'm saying, I I mean, again, you, you know, you can hear that I'm very influenced by Hartman and by um, Spillers and in conversation with Fuentes, like I don't, you know, we can't this isn't over, right? right, right the logics right. that this set in motion are not over. They're the, they're the, right. they're the. That's the, that's the afterlife of slavery. It's what we live in now, where you know the madness of, um, of, of racialized violence and the, from the people who are supposed to be protecting us, right? Like the, like every time you turn around, there's an example of the kind of derangement that we're talking about here, um, and part of what. I think those of us who are working in the archive at this moment are trying to do is kind of is like turn the turn our gaze in a way so that we're sitting with the chaos and the discomfort and the violation and in a way, but it's a hard balance because you don't I don't want to I don't want to um, turn this woman's I don't want to turn this woman into like a heroine. But I want to think through her, or with her, or is that? I don't know if that answers the question. No, it's a, yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you. So that's what I'm, that's that's my intention. Thank you. Yeah. I can't help. I'm sitting here thinking about two women from the 1850s. Mm -hmm. One is Harriet Tubman, mm -hmm. who is reuniting her family. Mm -hmm. She's the heroine. Mm -hmm. And then there's Margaret Garner. Mm -hmm. Yep. And I just sort of put her on the table. I've been thinking about her for the last hour, yep. Um, yep. Uh, killing her children mm -hmm. twice, you know, first mm -hmm. to one daughter and then another, uh, just getting out. There's this and moment in the in the newspaper accounts of Margaret Garner where she's quoted as saying, "Mother, help me kill the children," to her mother. And if I could title this book, "Mother, Help Me Kill the Children," like that to me, that sort mm -hmm. of the like impossibility of of the of what mother means in that sentence and in that action um, and the way in I mean t like and the I mean I think that's what you know that's what Toni Morrison was that's where she it's like this is not a story to pass on she says right like this is not a story that we can tell or that we can't tell right we can't pass this story we. We have to pass it on, but we can't pass it on because it's impossible to pass that on, right? So it's like that's that space exactly. So I I want to think through mm -hmm. Margaret Garner, and and I want to think through all of the spaces of impossibility that racial slavery imposes on people, right? And sometimes it's like huge, and it's you know, and we all know the story, and sometimes it's just these like tiny moments of you know that disappear and, and, and that's part of it also. It's like, okay, if I thread through this, what what it doesn't make new evidence appear, but it makes us 
think of Margaret Garner as being in a place of like profoundly monstrous logic, right? And what does that, what is produced in that moment? And that it's also, and to me also the mother, it's like, because I think we're more familiar with this, the, with Garner's act and act, you know, like Garner as mother to those children, but not Garner as daughter mm -hmm. to a mother who's with her, you know? Like all of it is just, yeah. It's, un, it's unspeakable, it's unthinkable, and it's the, exactly the place that we need to speak and think. Yeah, thank you. Well, it looks like um, it's time for us to wrap this up. Thank, thank you. you so much.